All right, I want to start this unit with the discussion of how to quantify noise and a very key quantity for any types of discussion on requirements, which is the signal to noise ratio. So let's start off with what is noise. And we'll just refer to noise as any unwanted component of the signal. That's of any component that's not containing the information coming from the transmitter. And the key challenge in any communication system is really to estimate that transmitted signal that is the desired component in the presence of noise. Now, there are many sources for noise in practical communication systems. The first type is what you would call internal or thermal noise, and that's generally just from random fluctuations in the active components of your receiver. But there are other types as well. For example, there's also distortions in the uh, receiver. Those could be phase noise, quantization, there could be channel estimation errors, nonlinearities, and so on. They're not really noise in the sense that they're not additive random components of the signal, but in certain cases, we might want to model it as such. The third type is what you could call external interference. These are signals, man-made signals, coming from other sources, so other transmitters, as maybe I've illustrated in this diagram here. And here it's important to think about two types of sources. One are transmissions in the same band that you're transmitting in, and the other types are out of band, but any type of transmission is generally not exactly spectrally constrained, so it will leak into neighboring bands and you will get some interference from that. We'll mostly talk about in this unit the um, thermal noise, and then we'll go back to think about interference later in this class when we talk about multi-user systems. All right, so let's talk a little bit then about how we model thermal noise. The, typically, the simplest model mathematically is to model as an additive white Gaussian source. So let's say you have a signal X of T, which is coming from the transmitter, and your receiver will then just get the sum of that desired signal plus the additive white Gaussian noise, W of T. Now, this uh, representation could apply either in the real passband, that is, when it's at the carrier frequency. In this case, all these signals are real valued, and the power spectral density of W of T would be typically denoted by N0 over 2, because there are two images both below 0 and above 0. We'll mostly, though, deal with it in the complex baseband, which is the what you would get after you down-convert. And in this case, the power spectral density would be N0, and all the signals will be complex. All right, so that's pretty easy, just total review of uh, digital comm. Let me just do a couple more things. Talk about the units. Remember that the power spectral density is always going to be in watts per hertz because it's a power per unit frequency. But if you look at watts per hertz, remember that is power per time and hertz is one over time. So you get, uh, sorry, energy per time. So this is also, the units are also in joules. And the reason why it has the units of joules is because it's really energy per degree of freedom, or equivalently the energy in any orthogonal sample. Um, we typically write these in dB scale, again, because of the wide dynamic range that we see in, dy in wireless systems. So for example, you could divide it by one millijoule, and the units could be written then as dBm per hertz. I'll give you lots of concrete examples so you get some ideas of the typical numbers that you would deal with. All right, um, a very important aspect of thermal noise is that there are fundamental limits to how low that noise can be. It turns out that from statistical physics, the minimum noise floor is always given by this fundamental physics constant, which is Kt, where K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. So if you work that out at typical uh, temperature, this temperature is in Kelvin, so you have 290, then this value turns out to be one, minus 174 dBm per hertz. So this is a level of noise you can't get rid of. Any active system that's receiving these signals will experience this at least this level of noise. In 
fact, most practical systems get a little higher noise than this because of receiver imperfections. And that increase is written as the, called the noise figure. And it, de it depends on the quality of the receiver, or typically, as we'll see, the low noise amplifier. And that number is usually around 2 to 9 dB. Um, and maybe later on at the end of this class, if I have a chance, I'll talk about some of the designs and the trade-offs you can have in terms of both form factor and power to try to trade off this noise figure. All right, so that leads us to a very important quantity called the signal to noise ratio. So to define that, imagine we have a signal X and we receive that signal with some noise. And suppose that the signal X is shown here in blue, so it has a power spectral density SX over a bandwidth B, and the noise has some power spectral density N0. So in this case, we simply define the signal to noise ratio as the ratio of these two power spectral densities, which is SX over N0, or equivalently because that power, let's say, is um, uniform over that bandwidth, will be the received power over the bandwidth divided by N0. And this is a key performance metric. In particular, it will determine the spectral efficiency that you can get in a practical system. This quantity is typically quoted in dB because this is a dimensionless uh, value. All right, let's just do a simple calculation, very easy. So suppose the receive power is minus 80 dBm, and the noise figure is 6 dB, and the bandwidth is 20. And I ask you, what's the SNR? This is an easy calculation. First, what we do is we look at the thermal noise, which will be the Boltzmann, uh, our fundamental limit, plus the noise figure. That will be our thermal noise, N0. Then the SNR will be the received power divided by the bandwidth minus that thermal noise. So you just plug those guys in, you get a minus 80, minus, minus 174, that minus 6 coming from the noise figure, and this value coming from the bandwidth. And in this case, you get about 15 dB. All right, so that's easy. Um, that looked at the value in continuous time, but most of the systems, of course, that you deal with, or if you want to simulate systems, you have to look at sampled data versions of that. So the West model this as follows. We have some imagined continuous uh, complex baseband si signals, which for this slide I've put in these subscript Cs to make that clear. And imagine that we sample it as follows. We typically can model the A to D conversion as two steps. There's some receive filter, which I'll denote by PRX, and then some kind of ideal sampler. All right, so that's a typical model for an ADC. All right, and then in discrete time, of course, the final samples R of N will have two components, one coming from the signal X, which I'll denote by X of N, and one coming from the noise, which I'll denote by W of N. All right, the um, analysis of the SNR in this is pretty easy. So here's our signal in continuous time again. And let's just, to make the analysis easy, I assume a kind of an ideal low-pass filter. So it's basically a sync uh, convolutional kernel. And so that's grad getting the data in some uh, bandwidth B uh, centered at uh, zero, in this case, because it's in complex baseband. All right, the first thing to observe is that if the signal, original continuous time signal, is entirely contained in this band, then the energy per sample of the output um, uh, R of n will be limited, will be exactly the received signal power times the time uh, duration of that sample. So it's just ES is PRX times T. Now, I actually, if we take the digital comm class, I'll go ahead and show all these formulas, but you can see, you can understand these formulas just uh, qualitatively here. Uh, the other part is that uh, since we have an orthonormal um, filter here, that the noise energy per sample will also be N0. So this is why I was saying that you can think of the N0 either as a power spectral density, or you can think of it as an energy because it's the energy integrated in any orthonormal sample. Okay, and from this then we can get the resulting SNR in discrete time, which will just be ES over N0, and plugging that in, we can get that as, for example, the received power over the bandwidth times N0. And that exactly corresponds to that continuous time definition that I gave earlier. 
All right, um, there is a demo in the GitHub site. Remember, all the links are below this video. And in this demo, I just walked you through some very simple MATLAB code um, where I generate uh, 16 font symbols and show you how to add the noise um, in MATLAB. It's super easy. The I just tell you, I put this demo here because the number one uh, error that students get when doing simulations is that they miss scale the noise or the signal or both. So it's super important to get that uh, scaling correct. So just be very careful when you do the scaling. And I've shown you how to do that. So you just calculate the uh, symbol uh, energy, scale the signals appropriately. And then in this case, I used uh, MATLAB's COM uh, toolbox to add the noise. And I've tried to show you how to set the parameters according accordingly. All right, so take a look at that on your free time and uh, make sure you use the scaling correctly when you're doing any SNR based simulation. A uh, couple last things I want to mention in this section. Uh, first is about a cascade of elements. So most receivers, of course, process signals in multiple stages. For example, there may be an LNA and then a mixer and uh, maybe another uh, conversion step or something. All right now, the way that we model this is that each stage will typically have some gain, we'll call that GI, and also have a noise figure. And what we're interested in knows what the end-to-end -end gain and noise figure is. That is fairly uh, straightforward, or at least the gain is super straightforward. Obviously, it's a linear system, so the gain will just be the product of these gains. Well, the product in if everything's in linear scale. The noise figure has an also, um, there's an equivalent total noise figure, and it also has a simple expression shown here. And what it uh, is, is that the f you'll get a noise figure from each component. The first will just, the component will add this, the original, its noise figure. But the subsequent uh, stages will add these formulas like this. And the reason why this formula comes in is that each element is adding kind of a um, effective noise uh, proportional to the noise figure minus one times kt. So that's where this comes from and is divided by the gain because the signal would be amplified at this uh, point here. Now one consequence of this is that you typically when you're trying to design a practical receiver is to try to put as much gain and less low noise figure initially. You want to get the low noise figure because you're going, that's going to have this term here. And then you want it to have a high gain because you want to try to suppress the noise figures in the subsequent components. So for this reason, most designs start with what's called a low noise amplifier. And we'll give you some examples of the types of uh, figures of merit, if you like, from LNAs, practical LNAs. All right, so let's just do a problem. This comes from Andy Mollisher's book. Um, let's say the attenuator has a loss of one and a half dB. So there's initially some attenuator that could be the loss, for example, on the feed line from the antenna before it gets to the LNA or any other types of resistive losses. Then we have a low noise amplifier with a gain of about 10 dB and a noise figure of four. And then a mixer, which is um, which has unit gain in this case and a noise figure of one. And then I want to know what the total noise and gain. All right, so we want to first compute, convert everything to linear scale. So for example, in the first one, we have a noise figure of um, one, in this case, in linear scale, because it's a passive device, so it won't add any noise. And its gain will be 0 0.707 in this case. Note that gain is less than one because it's actually having a loss. It's attenuating the signal. All right, the uh, second uh, stage has a uh, noise figure in linear scale of 2.51, and again, in this case of 10, and we can work that out for the subsequent stages. The total gain is easy because it's the product of the gains in linear scale, or it's the sum of the gains in dB scale. We'll just add these values. So the total gain is 8.5 dB. And the total noise figure, we just use our formula, plug in all those values, and you get a noise figure of about 5 dB. So we see here that the noise figure of this first component kind of dominated. All right, uh, final thing I want to talk about is interference. Again, I'm going to talk more about interference when we talk about multi-user systems at the end. But just as a quick uh, 
discussion about the topic here. Uh, interference, of course, is uh, any signals from other transmitters using the same band at the same time. And this occurs really fundamentally due to the broadcast nature of the wireless um, mid, uh, medium. And the effect then is to add to the total noise seen at the receiver. So for example here, imagine that this wireless access point is transmitting maybe to your laptop. So there's a desired signal. And the same case is that another access point is transmitting to another um, uh, laptop here. But this is radiating in uncontrolled directions. It's not a very directional signal. So some of that signal from C might go to B, and that would be interference. So let's just do a very simple interference calculation. Um, suppose, for example, again, the noise figure is, say, 4 dB, and the bandwidth is 20 megahertz, and the interference power is minus 95 dBm, and the signal power is minus 80 dBm. So the interference power is about 15 dB lower. And I want to find both the signal-to-noise ratio and the signal-to-interference plus noise ratio. All right. This is again pretty easy. What we do is I <coughs> um, first calculate the thermal noise, which will be the KT plus the noise figure. So that's minus 170 TBM per hertz. So the noise um, energy or noise power uh, in DBM, I can just compute that with the bandwidth, will be minus 97 DBM. So the SNR, if I didn't have interference, would be minus 80. A minus minus 97, which would be 17 dB. But I can also get compute the um, noise plus interference power. The trick here is to make sure you add these two numbers in linear scale. So I'm going to take this minus um, the uh, minus 97 in linear scale here, and this minus 95 in linear scale here and then convert it back to dBm and get the net effect is about minus 93 dBm. And then I can subtract that from the signal power to get about minus, to get about 13 dB. So we saw in this case that we had about 17 dB of SNR without accounting for the interference and it went down to about 13 when I accounted for it. All right, so that's uh, fairly straightforward. Only thing you have to do is make sure you keep track of which is a power, which is in linear scale, and which is in dB. All right, that wraps up this section. Before you go on, just to test, uh, make sure that you understand the concepts, I've put a very simple uh, problem in the in-classes exercise for this unit. The, again, all of these are on the GitHub site with the link below. And in this, I just wanted you to simulate a cascade of two elements, an LNA and a mixer. Um, and what I'll just do is just transmit some symbols, um, add some noise in each stage, and then measure the resulting SNR. Should be fairly straightforward. Uh, just go ahead and do this, and once you're done, you can go on to the next section.